So to our, our speaker today, it's a massive pleasure for me to be able to introduce Professor Richard Naga, who's kindly agreed to give this year's Antipode Lecture. Um, Richard is Professor of the College in the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota, and currently also the Russell M. and Elizabeth M. Bennett Chair in Excellence, as well as the uh, Beverly and Richard Fink Professor in Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota. She's based in the Department of Gender, Women and Sexuality Studies um, at the University of Minnesota, but also shares affiliations with the Departments of Geography, Asian Studies and American Studies, um, which I think kind of reflects the ways that Richard's groundbreakingly undisciplined work cuts across the humanities and the social sciences and also cuts across the borders of languages, genres, disciplines and not least geographical locations as well. She holds undergraduate degrees from, uh, an undergraduate degree from Lucknow, India, a master's degree from Pune, uh, and a PhD from Minnesota, all in geography, so we're able to claim you as a geographer, just this afternoon at least. Um, Richard's work will be familiar to, to many of us here this afternoon. Her early research focused on the everyday geographies of gendered and racialized community politics amongst four um, Asian communities in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, which was the subject of her PhD research. Uh, and building on the methodologies and collaborative, collaborative ways of working that she developed through that work, her subsequent activity has been predicated on building long-term relationships and situated solidarities with specific struggles around gender, intellectual disempowerment, and marginalization in relation to the mechanics of NGO work. Her work with the Sangtin writers in the Sitapur district of Uttar Pradesh, India, which commenced in 2002, is, I think, exemplary in this respect. Beginning as a, a, a collective of nine women writing, thinking, and together discussing the NGOization of their everyday lives and the subsequent forms of disempowerment they experienced, the project resulted in the publication, first of, of the book Sangtin Yatra in 2004, in India and in Hindi, followed subsequently in 2006 by the English language book Playing with Fire, Feminist Thought and Activism Through Seven Lives in India, published by the University of Minnesota Press. Uh, and these books, um, certainly the latter I think will be well known to many of us here. They have, I think, been pioneering projects of transnational feminist scholarship uh, and of the co-production of knowledge as well. And, and besides it, its grounded political interventions, I think this work has helped scholars to think methodologically about just how to go about breaking down the boundaries between the academy and our field sites and communities, whilst also retaining and making the best of the, the protected space that universities offer for the development and discussion of post and decolonial thought and praxis. Richard's work with the Sangtin writers has also helped to constitute a broader movement now comprising several thousand farmers and labourers in Uttar Pradesh. Her 2014 book, Muddying the Waters, co-authoring feminisms across scholarship and activism, is a further reflection on the post and decolonial potential of feminist and collaborative research. It's a book that confronts and embraces the, the messiness of solidarities and responsibilities forged through stories, encounters, fragments, translations, and what Richard refers to as a necessary opening to radical vul vulnerability on the part of the researcher. It plays, I think, not just with the utility and logic of the neat positions and categories that we all too often fall into or are forced to slip into in the academy, but also, it, it, it's a book that plays with a form and, and genre of academic writing and its relationship to the political <clears throat> in really interesting ways, I think. Um, Richard is also the, the co-author and editor of uh, many other books, uh, five that I could count, actually, um, in both Hindi and English. And she's the author of many other excellent articles uh, and book chapters, which have been published in our own disciplinary journals like Antipode, Gender Place Culture, Social and Cultural Geography, the Singapore Journal of Tropical Geography, but also interdisciplinary journals like Science, Critical Asian Studies, and Economic and Political Weekly. When the theme of this year's conference was, was announced, Richard was a, a, an instant and obvious choice for us at Antipode, 
and we're thrilled uh, that she accepted our invitation to present the lecture here today because I think she's, she's consistently been a, an exemplary figure in de- and post-colonial praxis within our, intellectual, our own intellectual landscape. So today, Rich is going to be uh, presenting a paper that builds on, on previous work, um, but connects to a new book project, I believe. Uh, the title of our talk is Retelling Stories, Disrupting the Social, Relearning the World. And, and after her talk, of course, we'll open up for questions and discussion. But please now do join me in welcoming Richard to the stage. Thank you very, very much, Tarek, for that very generous and thoughtful introduction. Um, I want to thank everyone who is involved in organizing this conference and specifically in bringing me here. I know that uh, um, Andrew Kent, in particular, um, worked very, very hard for all the arrangements that uh, allowed me to be here with you today. So a very special thanks to you, um, Andy, and also to the entire Antipod editorial team for inviting me here today. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be invited to give this lecture, and I arrive in this space with a sense of deep humility. I recognize that for each one of us who's afforded the means or tools to step in with an authority to make knowledge claims, there are millions of others whose words and knowledges we stand on, but who have been systematically erased from or made invisible on the pages and spaces of formal learning, except, of course, as objects and subjects who must be researched, discussed, and at times uplifted by the experts. In the context of the historical and ongoing violence of these absences and erasures, it becomes important to ask, who else do we bring with ourselves onto the page or stage? Who are the voices we rely on for weaving our stories, but whose tones and accents remain unheard and unacknowledged in our scripts? Who are the people who remain forgotten in our citational practices and for whom the conventional citations of the academy remain meaningless? Can we hope to achieve greater justice in and through the ways that these unheard tones, stolen voices, and erased knowledges are rendered through academic practices? On the opening pages of his book, Politics and Emotion, the Song of Telangana, Himadeep Muppidi reminds us of the arts of storytelling, of proverbs and parables that can mend old tears and give birth to new solidarities. He talks of words drunk in the palm oil of stories and songs that can make bodies dance and sway toward new horizons. But he has a poignant reminder for us even as the narrator whose own body migrates and writes in spaces along the banks of both the Mississippi in Minnesota and the Musi in Telangana, Muppidi realizes that his writing can only happen in the confines of small rooms secured with colonial and neo-colonial pipelines. From these small rooms where books flow ceaselessly out of diverse terminals, he can hear a lot of agitation out there. This agitation, he says, is made up of the voices and rhythms of the villagers and villages near and far. He can feel their music, their excitedly, mu mo their excitedly moving bodies, but the books on his walls, English and Telugu alike, muffle the sounds from these places. Mupidi writes, and I quote, sometimes the books are helpless against the music and dancing, and I feel a need to venture out of these small rooms and wade into these new sources of epistemic energy. More often than not, however, I content myself with catching some notes and pulling together worldly pages on what those beats do to me or mean to my body. Writing them down in the confines of these rooms is more compelling than joining the dances in the streets and towns and villages sprawling outside. 
And then he asks, could it be because in this world of small rooms, politics should always be parlayed into newer and newer fabrications? Or is it because my academic body and assemblage of so many words is incompetent at engaging politics otherwise? End of quote. My current project, Hungry Translations, Retelling Stories, Disrupting the Social, Relearning the World, is fired in many ways by the restlessness of those who believe in cracking the book-studded walls of those small rooms by bringing them into vibrant, even disturbing conversations with the bodies out there that perform and protest. I engage the truths that often get muffled when words from one place are translated into more words of another language and robbed of their accents and meanings. When the words are not accompanied by the embodied vocabularies and gestures that give them life after they're uttered. I'm concerned about that which cannot be heard or felt through words alone, especially when those words are written down and caged in familiar fonts in a predictable sequence of black and white pages. While every translation or retelling tries to be ethical, the translations I argue for emanate from ongoing disquiet and hunger for the ways in which those of us who resist or refuse the seclusion of the small book-walled rooms can build deep alliances with those who protest and dance out there, but without romanticizing their voices and movements. For perpetually hungering for ways that can make our translations abide by the terms of the struggles we stand with, even as they escape the limits imposed by the disciplined terms of the academy. So to begin performing these hungry translations, I would like to introduce some of the companions from whom I have learned a few things about the undisciplined arts of translation and also about the embodied politics of hunger and knowledge making. Among these teachers are sathis and supporters of Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, the movement that Tariq mentioned in his introduction. Um, so this, the acronym for this movement is SKMS. It is a movement now of 8,000 farmers and laborers um, that are working in over 150 villages of Sitapur district. And just quickly, Sangatin is a term of deep reciprocity. Um, it is original. In, in the language of the, it is meant only for women, but the movement has claimed it more widely without making that kind of gendered distinction between women and men. Uh, Kisan is a farmer, big or small. Mazdoor is laborer, and um, Sangatan is the term for organization. And so some of the things that I, I want to show you a quick video, th three minutes or so. It's an old video, about seven, eight years old, but it provides an important context for this long-term um, alliance um, that, again, uh, I think Tariq very helpfully summarized. But I want to show you a quick, quick video here. The writing and publication of the book, Sangatin Yatra, between 2002 and 2004 paved the way for what became Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, a movement of 5,000 peasants and laborers. <laughs> In 2007, members of Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan decided to document the making of their movement in another Hindi book, Ek Aur Neem Saar. Along with the writing of the book, came newspapers, pamphlets, diaries, and more recently, songs and plays that build connections and analyses across struggles. Or 
और ऐसा नहीं है कि कोई मिश्रिक और पिसावा में है नखलऊ दिल्ली और अमेरिका और इजराइल सारे देशों में पसरा हुआ है तभी वो लंबी लड़ाई लड़ पाएगी वरना ये छोटी छोटी लड़ाइया बहुत थकाती है और आगे की खुली प्रेरणा नहीं दे पाती कि क्या भूमिका है ये सिर्फ दो तीन ही लोग इसके बारे में बात ना करें इसको सच में लोग इसको समझें कि ये हमारे लिए इसलिए इसकी पुख्ता नियम की ज़रूरत है कि हम इस ये आंदोलन का एक बहुत बड़ा हिस्सा है चीज़ें हैं लोगों के पास ठीक है वो शब्द नहीं होते हैं बस लेकिन अगर जब ऐसी कुछ चीज़ें चलती हैं तो वो जोड़ते हैं अपने आप वो चीज़ें चलती हैं हम लोगों को समझने की ज़रूरत पड़ेगी दूसरे लोगों को कि वो कैसे चीज़ें द जर्नी हैज ऑल्सो सॉट to destabilize dominant notions associated with field work by making academic and activist forums located in the united states of america a part of sangatins field sites chola maati ke ra So SKMS fights for dignity and justice for its sathis or members and refuses what Joyce King calls epistemological nihilation. Uh, King uses this term epistemological nihilation building on Sylvia Winter and it specifically refers to the negation total abjection or denial of one's being. In SKMS's case of course epistemological nihilation is committed by those who see its members as the uneducated poorest of the poor or as people belonging to the margins or being on the margins skms emerged as you heard from this book called sangatin yatra or a journey of sangatins that eight rural women activists and i undertook in hindi and avadhi between 2002 and 2004 Since then the stories of the book have traveled as translated texts in multiple languages including Turkish, Marathi and Bahasa Indonesia. Along with this dance of the text the people's movement in Sitapur has become part of my everyday life regarding of my regardless of my physical location. at different times and with and with different intensities i have worked with the sathis as either a scribe or a theater worker or a co-strategist from near and afar as i have wrestled with the intricacies and dilemmas of my task as a storyteller of the movement my labor and passion as a member of the us academy have become necessarily centered on grappling with questions of ethical responsibility and co-authorship within and across borders and hierarchies in ongoing alliance work so to develop my argument today i share with you three short stories from my alliance work in skms the first story is called standing together and through this story i introduce sunita and tarun everyone who finds out about it in the village of kumrapur rushes to the skms dairy It isn't every day after all that the meetings of the Sangathan involve an actor from Mumbai. SKMS inv- has invited Tarun all the way from Mumbai to Sitapur to help create a play and the energy that is emerging in the village as a result of his arrival is intoxicating. And here you see um, Surbala and Tarun and the puppet is called Rani. A cluster of nine people gather on a tiny koir khatiya threatening to break the poor cot into pieces while another six people sit on the periphery of a rectangular wooden takht where Tama sets himself up with his dholak next to Pita Kamlesh and Richa Singh As people pour into the meeting ground Reena and Shammu who everybody calls the pillars of the dairy rush inside to to get two more dharis and they spread the dari behind the cot and the takht the extra seating of course vanishes in seconds as enthusiastic young women both the bahus and the bitias the daughters in law and the daughters they grab a spot wherever they can find it 
Outside the circle of seated people stand dozens of people, young and old. When children who try to peek in find their gaze blocked by adults, some men plant these children on their shoulders while others bounce them up on the seats of the bicycles that the passersby have halted at the scene of the theater workshop on their way to the fields. But where is Sunita, someone asks. Sunita, an active sati of SKMS, lives right next to the dairy. Those from Kumrapur already know that she cannot join us because her young daughter was burning with high fever. Someone murmurs that the daughter might have, might have been attacked by the polio virus. There's a shared moment of pause, as if to collectively recognize the sorrow and dread that Sunita must be feeling and then begin the vigorous beats of Tama's dolak, with Pita's voice reaching the sky, while Saraswati Amma claps and dances, and the perky glove puppet called Rani jumps around, causing commotion under, direction, under the direction of one hand after another. And I'll show you some of these glimpses here. So here is Tama on, at the dolak, Pita is singing, and then Kamlesh and Sarvesh are watching. This is Saraswati Amma uh, talking about all the uh, problems with the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Uh, the, the acronym for this is NAREGA. It is, um, it is an act that the government of India passed to give a minimum of 100 days of work to all the people who didn't have work in the villages. And it has been a source of great corruption, but also uh, for many movements, uh, such as SKMS, they have been struggling very hard and continuously to make sure that the government fulfills its promise. So here, Saraswati Amma talking about the corruption under Narega. And here is Saraswati Amma in action with other women um, and men of the SKMS. And here is Reena playing around with the puppet called Rani. And all the guys are watching the women in action. And here is Sunita. Sunita can hear every sound of her sati's acting and singing while she tends her daughter. She finds it impossible to stay away from the scene of spirited activities. She asks a friend to take care of her daughter for a couple of hours and joins the group. Grabbing the dholak from Tama, she circles around the crowd asking for punishment for all the corrupt village development officers who steal the wages of the laborers and leave their children to die. Even as Sunita performs the politics of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act with rage, several of us cannot focus entirely on what she is saying or doing. Our hearts keep thudding with fear about what awaits her at home at the end of the rehearsal. As a brand new visitor to SKMS, Tarun feels especially uncomfortable even a bit guilty about the circumstances in which Sunita has been moved to participate in the theatrical activities. At the end of the day, as everyone begins to leave, Sunita comes to Tarun and takes his hand in hers to say goodbye. Tarun is at a loss for words. He wants to do something to show his appreciation for the enormous contribution that Sunita has made to the group's work despite her dire circumstances. Not being able to come up with anything else, he sticks two currency notes in Sunita's palm and gently closes it into a fist. Sunita does not flinch or speak. Without looking down at her fist or at what has been inserted in it, she opens Tarun's palm, places the money back into his hand, and gently closes his fingers just like he had done with hers. For a wordless second, she looks straight into his eye and then says softly and firmly, you keep this bhaiya, give us your dua by standing with us. Dua means blessings and bhaiya means brother. I now move to my second short story. This is called My Voice Rising in Your Chest and through this I introduce Tama. Suddenly, the sun comes out and brings a brief respite from another wintry day in Pisama. It is that time of the year when the cold, damp, and heavy fog rules for weeks at a stretch. 
opening his left hand opening his left hand as if to catch the sunshine between his palm and fingers, Tama pulls the dholak closer to him. His almost sightless eyes cannot see the many pairs of eyes that are watching him, but his fingers gently explore every line, curve, and texture of that dholak. Watching Tama adjust his dholak with that familiar longing, the sathis of the theater workshop with Tarun immediately stop their discussion on what kind of play they want to create on the current state of corruption that the villagers are subjected to under Narega. They know that Tama wants to sing, and they know that Tama wants to sing now. In order to give the special effects to the beats, Tama begins to tie a thin stick to, his, to the index finger of his right hand with a nylon string. You can see it in the picture as well. As the string continues to tighten around his finger, Tarun remarks, Tama, why are you making, why are you making it so tight? Your blood will stop moving. So what? Tama laughs, locking his gaze into Tarun's. The string will only stop the blood from moving. It won't stop my voice or my dholak's dhamak from rising in your chest. After several hours of chatting, parodying, playing, and singing that day, Tama starts getting ready to go home before everyone else. A couple of satis uh, gently ask Tama to stay. They say, why are you going home, Tama? Hang out with us in Sitapur tonight. It'll be a lot of fun. Tama says, my mother and I have guests visiting. We are also your guests. Tarun smiles warmly at him. Why not stay with us tonight? Tama is visibly moved by Tarun's affectionate insistence that acknowledges a special kinship between them. With a wide grin that lights up his face, Tama claps in his inimitable style and takes this, the exchange to a deeper level. No, no, not tonight, bhaiya. Tonight, my mother will cook parathas. I promise to buy some oil for the parathas. Tama swiftly reaches into the left pocket of his khaki pants and pulls out a small glass bottle the size of Tarun's finger, and the two exchange a long glance. Among the things that are said and learned in the glance, not only by them, but also by anyone who witnesses the moment, are the complexities of the terrain on which all of us have decided to walk together as members and supporters in SKMS. The third story is called No Living Without Nautanki, and Nautanki is a kind of theatrical performance. Through this story, I introduce Prakash. Here's a picture of Prakash acting in a play from last December. Uh, we created a play against uh, the government of India's demonetization policy in Sitapur. So here's the third story. We are meeting as a group by Skype after a very long time. Kamal, Ram Beti, Richa Singh, Mukesh, and Prakash have all, all joined from Sitapur at night time while I'm sitting with my morning cup of chai in St. Paul. Usually, the practical problems in trying to arrange such a meeting are too many to make it worth the trouble. It is just simpler to connect by phone and to wait for the face-to-face -face meetings when I go back to India on my next trip. But the year 2015 has been different. Sitapur, along with the rest of the state of Uttar Pradesh, has been hit by a severe drought, the likes of which the small kisans and mazdoors of Uttar Pradesh have not seen in a long time. Throughout the month of February, Kisans, big or small, in village after village, have put a match to their fields. Burning the crops down to ashes has been easier than trying to deal with the crop rotting in the field. It is during one of these weeks when the fields are burning that Richa Singh says to me on the phone, some of us would like to meet you by Skype in order to discuss the future of our theater work. It takes us a couple of weeks to find a time when Prakash and Ram Beti can travel from the villages in Pisama block to the SKMS office in Sitapur town from where the group can Skype. When the meeting begins, we start with the ruined crop of wheat and mangoes. Hearts are so heavy that it is difficult to sustain the conversation. Then Prakash changes the subject suddenly. He says, aren't we gonna talk about Nautanki in this meeting? I say, sure, but it has been such a hard time. I didn't want to assume that whatever was, was important to the group two weeks ago is still the most important thing to discuss now. Prakash assures me that there's no reason for me to hesitate. 
He says, since there are no crops left, and he says it very matter-of-factly, since, no, since there are no crops left, the hunger for Nautanki has increased. Prakash's words are profound and passionate. Even through the hazy screens and barely visible images, we all feel each other smile serenely. I remember what Prakash said to me when we first met several years ago. He said, Natak Nautanki make you an addict. Once you get high on them, you remain intoxicated for life. I can live without food, but without Nautanki, there is no living now. So I now move from the hungry peasants to refusals, and I will develop the discussion in three parts. The first part is reliving learning moments. Sunita and Tarun have only known each other for less than three hours during the workshop, but the spark that connects them leads her to refuse his money in a manner that is inspiring and humbling. In calling Tarun bhaiya or brother, and in daring to return his money with an intimate insistence, Sunita in fact demands from Tarun a thicker, ongoing, and enduring kinship than one of a distant visitor who offers monetary help and then disappears without an emotional entanglement. Tarun's acute awareness of the gulfs between Kumrapur and Mumbai may have made him ambivalent about the terms of his relationship with Sunita, and it may have made him assume that the best help he could extend in that critical moment was to provide some monetary assistance for the treatment of Sunita's daughter. However, Sunita offers him a far bigger space, legitimacy, and responsibility in her and her companion's struggles one which he would have been too presumptuous to wish for in the absence of Sunita's generosity. Sunita's intense participation in the action that was happening outside of the dairy in Kumrapur embodies a hunger for politics through theater. Her dynamic with Tarun, furthermore, demands from him a trust and an ongoing relationship with SKMS, despite the uneven terrain that produces violent gaps between the social locations of Tarun and SKMS Sathis like herself. Yet this demand for trust is one that simultaneously involves the work of recalling, touching, and feeling the edges of the uneven terrain, lest they are forgotten in a romance of solidarity. And this is precisely the work that Tama does when he shows Tarun the tiny bottle which he hopes to fill with mustard oil so that his mother can cook parathas that night for their guests. While Tarun tries to address the uneven terrain by inviting Tama to stay with the group that night, Tama, Tama's words and gestures extend that work by potently enacting a reminder of a terrain where our ability to learn from and grow with one another simultaneously demands an intimate recognition of all of that which separates us. It demands that we recognize the hungers of the stomach that separate us as individuals, as well as learn to respect the hungers for creativity and justice that bring us together in situated solidarities in the face of those separations. This hunger for creativity and justice is exactly what comes to the forefront in Prakash's words in the Skype conversation in expressing his addiction to an embodied and creative engagement with politics and art, and in pronouncing his knees, need for Natak and Nautanki as larger than his need for food, Prakash disrupts dominant understandings of the social that are so ubiquitous in the landscape of academic research, teaching, and policy making. In a global context where hunger is repeatedly produced as a basic material requirement for the deprived and the poor, and where the origins of their hunger are always reduced to such noble factors as underdevelopment, natural calamities, or political unrest, Prakash refuses to be reduced to a body whose needs can be measured and turned into deliverable goods through expert interventions. And here in this discussion, I'm building on some writing that I've been doing with Dia da Costa. 
So along with Sunita and Tama, Prakash pushes us to confront at once the superficiality of the discourses that imagine poor mazdoors and kisans as hungry bodies, and the irony of bourgeois cliches which segregate those poor bodies from that of the hungry artist who's faithfully cast as an urban figure. His hunger for theater becomes a desire for critical solidarities against the unjust landscape that connects and separates us. This, for Prakash, is one of the fundamental meanings of politics. And the second part of the discussion I call obliteration, annihilation. Experts on the poor often have no trouble recognizing that those who live with the hunger of underfed bellies are also hungry for justice. Sadly, however, the same experts often refuse to appreciate their hunger for justice as a nuanced creative and intellectual hunger governed by a social imaginary that is often unintelligible through dominant mindsets. In reducing that complex hunger to a hunger of the belly, the archetypal sign of poverty, which can be alleviated by income to buy food, these dominant mindsets either shrink Sunita, Prakash, and Tama to bodies that must be fed, developed, or aided during humanitarian crises, or they simplistically celebrate them as uniquely dynamic actors on their local stages. In either case, whether they are celebrated or aided, um, such perspectives fail to acknowledge the fullness of the political vocabularies and visions of Sunita, Tama, and Prakash, for whom neither fever, nor blood, nor a failed crop becomes a barrier in pursuing art and politics as multidimensional experiences of mind, body, soul that are simultaneously material and affective creative and spiritual, theoretical and ideological. This raises the question, how do we disrupt our inherited understandings of the social that perform epistemic violence by obliterating or annihilating? How do we begin to recognize that which we have been disciplined not to anticipate, hear or appreciate? How do we learn to learn from Prakash, Tama and Sunita in ways that do not have the effect of annihilating them and anxiously bringing the focus back onto our own disciplinary frameworks and debates. Quing Pham confronts the violence of disciplinary annihilation in the context of international relations, or IR, when she asks, she says, why aren't peasants visible in IR and how has the willful oblivion of their knowledge been enacted over and over so methodically and imperviously? As a subaltern figure whose presence and voice are powerful and ubiquitous, yet effectively foreclosed from a convention-bound field, the peasant reveals for farm IR's limits of intelligibility. At the same time, peasant remains a perpetual subject of crisis as well as an object of intervention. Farm notes this contradiction, and she says, associating peasant with alarming problems such as backwardness, poverty, illiteracy, hunger, and suicide, the global machinery of development aims to elevate the peasant, the quintessential figure of underdevelopment, out of crisis into an improved life in its larger mission to improve the world. Farm argues that although peasants in the Western industrial context have been marginalized as either an economic minority or as a historical figure, peasants in decolonization movements have been contemporaneous political subjects capable of resisting empires and building alternative political futures. Rather than being equated with an essentialized identity or category then, peasant should be seen as a political subjectivity that is profoundly constituted through processes that articulate potent visions of self-determination and alternative ways of inhabiting and ordering the world. Farm demands that her readers recognize peasant poli politics as centrally engaged with the processes through which global structures constitute peasants' place in the world and shape the conditions of their living and dying. 
The third part of my discussion is called refusals. So when the worldviews and principles that shape the unstoppable creative turbulence and intellectual yearnings of this global peasant cannot be adequately grasped by the word poor realms of the epistemically disciplined, how do those who are annihilated respond? Those who share an alternative vision of ethics and justice may be able to order their everyday lives only by actively refusing to engage the structuring logics of the disciplining mindsets. In addressing this politics of refusals in the context of IR again, Farm reminds us that there is no single structuring logic and no particular type of power that is determinative of the world in which we now live nor of the world orders that are yet to come. Indeed, it is precisely the multiplicity of these structuring logics and sources of power that enable the peasant to articulate and effect what she calls a shift in values, ideas, institutions, and material life in the long-term process of the construction of a different world. The endurance and power of subaltern descent from dominant logics and structures emanates from their embeddedness in the life worlds that have been systematically marginalized. Such descent is a historically constituted living subjectivity. For Farm, it consists of not only the ability to challenge the dominant word ordering logics on their own terms, but also the capacity to reconstruct political relations by rearticulating collective values and institutions. It has both the ability to break the frame and the capacity to recompose the fabric of life and world. The dominant understandings that erase the political subjectivity of peasants in IR are very similar to the ones that annihilate the political subjectivity of all those bodies in the global south who are deemed as hungry, and especially when they are somehow also tainted with rurality. Quite frequently, these same bodies are assumed to be readily available for the interventions of certified experts who are eager to help or rescue them but whose efforts fail to acknowledge the ways in which the hungry actively create politics and knowledge by living and honing a dynamic vision of what makes the good life. The hope of the hungry then is entangled with the creative praxis of refusal against imposed terms and frameworks. However, I do not want to imply that refusals are dead ends. I would like to linger with refusals a bit so that I can draw attention to at least two different kinds of refusals. One which allows for a relation between self and other through a hunger for ongoing translations despite the unevenness of the terrain on which such translations take place. So the stories through which I introduce Sunita, Tarun, Tama, and Prakash give us a picture of such uneven terrain where refusals are open to the serendipitous ways in which politics and justice may be realized. The other form of refusal, upon which I will elaborate through a fourth story, forecloses the possibility of such relationship. Both refusals involve dissenting subjectivity that seeks to not only break the frame, but also to recompose the fabric of life and world. But while one hungers for a deeper ongoing relationship with the other, the second sees no hope for such ongoing engagement. It is the simultaneity of this hope and refusal embraced and enacted by those who are, see, who are seen as marginalized by reigning mindsets that animates my new project, Hungry Translations. I'm guided by the belief that those who are interested in grappling critically with the ethics of thinking, teaching, or representing the words and worlds of the othered have have much to gain by stepping out of our small rooms and by making ourselves vulnerable before the languages that we cannot fully grasp or repeat so that we can begin to feel the rhythms of other epistemic energies, what Tama calls his dholaks dhamak, um, that vibrate and dance around us. 
so that those of us who carry the stamps and burdens of our locations in such forms as caste privileges or PhD degrees or global mobilities can try to come closer to the spirit of these energies and grapple with the challenges they offer without reductively imprisoning them in our own frames so that we can translate ethically not with an aim of reaching greater perfection in the arts of en encaging translations, but with the goal of nonstop hunger for destabilizing the institutionalized logics and methodologies of expertise in ways that can converse across very different meanings of hunger, hope, and the good life. And I move now to my fourth story, which is translating refusal. Of the myriad people whom I bring with me when I write on a page, one is my colleague and Sangatin, Ram Beti. You see her here in this picture, a Dalit farmer who is an important leader of SKMS. I share with you a moment of refusal articulated by Ram Beti in the following words that she said to me in April 2013 in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, where CGIAR's research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, CCAFS, had invited us to a workshop on climate change, innovation, and gender. Ram Beti said, and I quote in translation, they say they want to learn from us, but I say we can never be partners as long as they, they keep talking in the same sentence about my cow's carbon emissions and the carbon emissions of global corporations. You can translate my words to them and theirs to me, but if they remain blind to our lives and truths, there can be no dialogue on this unjust terrain." End of quote. In 2013, the US-based CGIAR described it itself as the only worldwide partnership addressing agricultural research for development whose work contributes to the global effort to tackle poverty, hun hunger, and major nutritional imbalances and environmental degradation. That was CGIAR's definition, description of itself. Its CCFS's workshop on climate change, innovation, and gender was attended by representatives of small NGOs working, working in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Nigeria, Kenya, and Honduras, and by experts from Europe and North America who sought to encourage sustainable innovations among their partners in the global south by helping to reduce the carbon footprint. After reading the work of Sangatin writers, one of the workshop organizers contacted me and said that they wanted to learn from the work of, um, from the work of Sangatins and from our alliance work. So I researched the organization, and after asking some hard questions, I invited this person who had contacted me to come to Wintry St. Paul so that we could arrange an in-depth Skype conversation, uh, multiple conversations, but at least one um, long conversation with multiple people from the movement. Um, and this was, of course, happening across 8,000 miles. Um, so, these representatives of SKMS who traveled for the Skype conversation also traveled through dense fog to get to a location from where they could Skype. The objective behind these arduously undertaken journeys was to make sure that given CGIAR's history, SKMS could trust CCAFS's desire to learn from the Sathis. And if so, whether this trust was enough for SKMS to invest its energies in participating in the conference. Over the next four months, between December and April, I conveyed to the workshop organizers that the trip had to be worthwhile for Ram Beti to leave her standing crop in the field for several days and to suffer the humiliations necessary to get a passport and visa to travel from Sitapur to Phnom Penh. The incentive that CCAFS offered was a promise of a grand total of $5,000 to help with farming innovations that would benefit landless Dalit women farmers. 
Here was the deal. If SKMS continued its learning partnership with CCAFS, then 25 SKMS women, including Ram Beti, could have used that grand total of $5,000 to grow, grow, grow drought-resistant crops to gain more food security. And so here we are in Phnom Penh. Getting to Phnom Penh was a very difficult battle for Ram Beti and her SKMS companion, Richa Singh. Once we all assembled in Phnom Penh, however, the workshop participants tried to cross multiple borders in order to understand one another. Despite the organizers' desire to learn, however, the meeting was simply not set up for a just dialogue. Those of us representing SKMS felt like we were a collective on display. After several agonized nights and days in Cambodia that included Skype conversations and phone conversations with SKMS allies located in India, Ram Beti, Richa Singh, and I staged a meeting with our host. In this meeting, we acknowledged the good intentions of CCFS and thanked them for inviting us, but then SKMS withdrew from future conversations with CCAFS because of what Ram Beti summed up as an unjust terrain that was blind to the truths and lives of our Sathis, despite the workshop's expressed desire to build partnerships through dialogue. In a context of acute environmental degradation and food insecurity, where most members of SKMS make less than $2 a day and get less than 100 days of work in a year, and where Ram Beti in particular had to go through much pain and sacrifice to be able to come to Cambodia, it would have been totally ethical, I think, for us to take the money and then refuse the partnership later on. However, SKMS made the difficult decision to refuse the money that was contaminated by the epistemic annihilation that Ram Beti as an individual and that we as SKMS Collective experienced during the workshop. By pronouncing that CCAFS's desire to support Dalit Kisan and Mazdoor women like herself was tainted by the terms of the very terrain that made such a desire possible in the first place, Ram Beti declined to engage with CCFS's offer. Her refusal in turn gave SKMS the courage to refuse the $5,000 that SKMS could have seen itself as being entitled to. So let us use the lenses of this event to revisit the exchange that happened between Sunita and Tarun in Kumrapur during the theater workshop. In both cases, what was at stake was an uneven landscape that made the terms of transaction unacceptable to members of SKMS. In that case, Sunita said to Tarun, keep your money, just stand with us through your support by giving, giving your duas, by standing with us. In this case, Ram Beti and then SKMS said, we don't need CCAFS's money. But here in Phnom Penh, CCAFS's mode of engagement with the lives and knowledges of SKMS Sathis had decisively foreclosed any possibility of our hosts becoming a bhaiya in the way that Tarun was being drawn into a circle of kinship and responsibility by Sunita. SKMS had made a leap of faith in making a trip to Cambodia in the hopes of enabling genuine co-learning, but the workshop had made it clear that this had only been wishful thinking. The political geographies of subaltern struggle are increasingly configured in ways that necessitate encounters with difference, inequality, and hierarchy. And these encounters involve simultaneous translations across uneven terrains. When these translations are read as inherently unjust by any of the parties, then there is little hope for dialogue. In a global context of intricate diversity, intensifying conflicts, and increasing violence, how can we reconceptualize the responsibility of translating multiple and often conflictual local diversities? 
So far from being a scalar or a territorially defined concept, I invoke the local to include the regional, national, and socio-cultural, as well as the specific articulations or vernaculars that emerge from scientific expertise or theoretical expertise. So in that sense, the languages that we speak in, in spaces like this are also part of these uh, very specialized vernaculars that, that are local. So in thinking through this issue, I have found it useful to work with the concept of translation as discussed by Christy Merrill. If following Christy Merrill, we understand translation as both carrying across and telling in turn where what can be told is negotiated afresh in each round, then what possibilities of justice can be created by rethinking translation as an enterprise of ethical and ever open mediation across space, time, and struggle? Can the unevenness of the terrain be addressed in ways that allows systematically marginalized and erased conceptions of justice to get a fairer hearing in the global dialogues of the expert so that they are not epistemologically annihilated or obliterated? What does it take to reimagine translation as a dynamic, multi-directional process of ethical and politically aware mediation among otherwise impermeable local diversities, a process that is always open and hungry for new political possibilities that we may never have imagined before. So I'd like to suggest that Sunita's refusal opened up precisely such a possibility for a local conception of justice to emerge. Her way of returning Tarun's money reduced the unevenness of the terrain by shifting his status from a Mumbai-based acquaintance who could afford to give her some cash and theater training to a bhaiya whose involvement in the workshop had now made it his duty to stand with Sunita and her sathis in their collective struggle. In sharp contrast to the CCAFS hosts, whose already fixed definitions of food insecurity and gendered gaps, as well as the roles of the donor and the recipient, foreclosed the possibility of hungry translations, Sunita's move was marked by an affective imagination that craved justice for herself and her sathis through the possibility of ongoing translations without erasing the significance of that which separated Tarun from the Sangatan. So the question is, what makes a translation hungry? While most translation seeks to be ethical in some way or another, I don't think anybody would ever say that they're translating unethically. You know, whatever it is that we believe in, we try to do justice to that. But hungry translations are marked by a desire for an ongoing negotiation of justice. The political potential of hungry translations lies in this yearning to keep translation open and flowing. This kind of hunger in a translation cannot be demanded or achieved through mechanical protocols. It can only emanate through ongoing embodied alliances that produce an intense relationality among those who occupy different locations in predominant epistemic hierarchies. This relationality defines a situated solidarity where our minds, bodies, hearts, and tongues can become radically vulnerable in ways that embrace diverse ways of knowing and co-creating. Such hungry translations can disrupt projects that seek to educate, modernize, or emancipate certain categories of bodies through globalized vernaculars that reproduce a landscape of intellectual enfranchisement and dispossession. This kind of radical vulnerability demands that we let go of thinking of ourselves as autonomous or sovereign social beings and recognize ourself as intensely relational or codependent on the other. Whatever we learn, whatever we come to be, becomes deeply contingent on what each one of us is prepared to give to the collective journey that unites the I and we with the you and they. 
by generatively disrupting such categories as writer, educator, activist, artist, kisan, and mazdoor, embodied alliances enable the formation of multiple interpretive communities so that people in the so-called margins do not simply become raw materials or suppliers of stories. Rather, each member of the alliance becomes empowered to unlearn, relearn, and negotiate which stories can cross which borders, in which form, when, and with what intentionality. Such storytelling moves across contexts and sociopolitical idioms and vocabularies, across forms and genres, and it recognizes how different forms of labor that constitute protest much, must shift with every staging according to context and according to audience, and each time pushing for new forms of co-constitutive re-theorizing, re-strategizing, recalling, and retelling. In this translational praxis, the meanings of the political cannot be learned in a fixed formulation. Rather, this praxis is a complex dance between, among, and across multiply located discursive sites without a stable origin or destination. This praxis unsettles and destabilizes the cultural and material economies of intellectual enfranchisement and disenfranchisement that are embedded in the dominant notions of the expert and in dominant ways of author authoring and authorizing. It allows a mode of becoming and being and co-creating in and through a continuously unfolding politics without guarantees. A desire to partake in and contribute to hungry translations requires that we do not merely travel to the othered worlds that form the basis of our knowledge claims. Rather, we must dwell in those worlds and embed ourselves in the relationships and hopes that form those worlds, so that that which has been othered in dominant imaginaries may emerge differently in our consciousness and conscience and in our ways of being. This desire for a deeply aware relationship between our acts of translating and the politics of world making is not reducible to a longing for improving the quality of our research. It is also not about producing better critical ethnographies. And it is not an argument for greater caring for the other. Nor is it a yearning for, that is driven by some kind of romantic notion of activist scholarship, where we do our activism outside the academy and then return to the academic mode to narrate or theorize the subjects and objects of that activism. Instead, this is a hunger for an intense transformative engagement with social worlds that can inspire intellectual and political agitation by remaking how we locate ourselves in relation to the bodies, stories, wisdoms, and worlds that we move between and that we represent and reimagine through our words and motions. It is an insistence on building abiding trust and reciprocities between unequal regimes, those which produce the regimes that produce the big and small rooms studded with books, reports, and case studies on the one hand, and those that refuse the norms, frames, and expectations on, uh, sorry, um, th those that refuse the norms, frames, and expectations of what is spelled out in those pages on the other. I'm going to just read that last sentence again. Um, so it is an insistence on building abiding trust and reciprocities between unequal regimes, those which produce the big and small rooms studded with books, reports, and case studies on the one hand, on the one hand, and those that refuse the norms, frames, and expectations of what is spelled out in those pages on the other. Now, this hunger for full-bodied engagements and translations that I'm arguing for must refuse comfortable closures or transparent renderings of meanings. It must have a provincializing effect on our knowledge-making paraphernalia, our terms, concepts, our theories, our methods. 
in reconceptualizing politics as a shared and unending labor on an uneven terrain that makes perfect translation impossible, hungry translations must destabilize our inherited meanings of the social and make our knowledges more humble, more tentative, and more alive to the creativity of life. These translations must fearlessly search for poetic justice and social justice through a continuously evolving praxis that animates collective consciousness without compromising the singularities that constitute each community of struggle. These hungry translations must ensure that the collective labor of weaving, dream, weaving dreams and tunes for a better world can kept keep moving, inspiring, without believing in pre-proclaimed arrivals. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's really, really interesting. And I think your main sort of thesis that um, this idea of people being reduced to hungry bodies, lacking agency, is such an important pro you know, problem people have looked at from, you know, from different perspectives. Uh, and the term that you used, epistemological annihilation, is pretty hard-hitting, but it's probably quite accurate as well. People not featuring as political subjects, agents of their own lives and their own destinies. But uh, the question I've got is, I just wonder if there's a kind of almost the opposite danger, too, of the one that you've, uh, you've alluded to. If we dwell with and embed ourselves within communities that we wish to show solidarity with, if we engage with them on... Uh, hopefully I'm not caricaturing you here, but you'll, you'll get the point. If we engage th with them on that kind of interpersonal and effective level, it could be that we recreate them and come to regard them not as political subjects, but as cultural subjects. And then the kind of immediacy of experience uh, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Or at best, maybe we create them as political subjects where politics is circumscribed to what is local. And I think my, my answer to this would be simply say that, you know, to go back to the point you started with about people sitting inside with their books. Maybe we have to go back to the books ourselves, read them again, pass them to people outside and debate with them, because words aren't caged within books. Words in books enable us to transcend <coughs> experience and for people to develop as philosophical and political thinkers. So that's kind of the opposite side of subjectivity too, uh, the, the need for sort of political subjects to transcend experience and effect too. I think um, what we might do is, if it's okay, just take a couple of questions and group them. So do we have a, any other questions immediately? Yeah, there's one uh, down here. Thank you for the presentation, and I was uh, really happy to see all of the really creative work um, uh, being done in Uttar Pradesh. Um, with, the, with the whole crew. I was wondering um, about uh, the presentation of this work in these kinds of spaces like this, in this kind of building and in this context. And I was wondering, I thought it would be really cool if the same kind of like energy of the acting out that was going on, like the ways people were actually, you know, um, meeting together in those in, in the office space and actually acting out um, a lot of either their grievances or their situations. I wonder um, how you imagine or you could imagine that kind of thing could happen here amongst us. Like, how could that same methodology that we're activating people in those spaces in the context of that movement, could that methodology actually be done here with us and um, to help us, you know, I don't know, because we're trying to decolonize this place or something. I, so I heard that was what was going on. And I was wondering if you think that that kind of methodology mm -hmm. might be, mm -hmm. might actually work here with us. I, I feel oppressed yep. too. I'd like some of that. Thanks. Do we have one more right now? We're sure. Yeah, there's one over there. Back. Thank you very much for a really inspirational uh, lecture. Uh, I just had a question for um, what advice would you give um, early career scholars in the context of the neoliberalization of the academy? 
uh, how would you advise that people form long-term engagements with the people that they wish to work with or on behalf of in the context of short-term uh, research posts and precaritization of the academy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, I think I understand the second and the third question better than I understood the first. So um, let me just, just repeat what I think the question was. And if I've missed something, if you could uh, elaborate again, I would appreciate it. So um, I, I, if I were to distill the question, um, I would say that you were you are saying that in, in, in paying attention to these hungry translations or in trying to uh, attend to the question of epistemic nihilation, there is a danger of uh, sort of um, um, r romanticizing the, the, uh, the local or the experiences, the way that those experiences, those local experiences, um, can also do the same kind of, can also become a dominant language? Or if I've missed that, if you could just elaborate on it, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, well, I, I guess, to go back to your comment at the beginning about the, the guy in the, in the room with the book was kind of muffling the sound from outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I, I, the dangers of caricaturing. In, in yeah. Sense, those words in, that, in those books and the philosophers and the political thinkers who, who wrote them, right. those are also things we need to make available to people. Um, in addition, yes. to, not instead of the, the kind of interpersonal, you know, these projects involve yep. sort of interpersonal solidarity as well. Of course, historically, people have shown solidarity with people that they've never met, right. which countries they've never been to. And very often, it's been a unifying political idea that's achieved that, not actually meeting them. Right. Um, Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think uh, the, the quotation I, I begin with from Himadeep Mupidi, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very, it's, it's, it's provocative and compelling. Um, and what is interesting about the way he talks about this, uh, he, he's specifically referring to the movement in Telangana. Um, and, and I think what he's saying here is that it's not, you can't really make a distinction between books produced by experts in English and books produced in Telugu. So in that sense, he's also complicating that kind of distinction that, oh, here is, you know, here is our, uh, our theory or our knowledge versus the, you know, the foreign knowledge, what he's really saying is the ways that um, the academic experts become more and more comfortable with those, with those rooms that, are, that operate through books alone. And, and I think, um, again, his concern is more that uh, when we make our arguments, when we make, um, when we make our conversations in, in these in these spaces, then we are only responsible to what has been circulating in those spaces. And how do we then um, disturb the the frameworks by bringing something that we have never anticipated before? So I, I think it's more an argument for um, pushing us to anticipate or hear. So, and a lot of times. Uh, what happens in the academic uh, conversations is that we see critical ethnographies or activist scholarships as ways that um, we can address that problem. That you know, we because we don't want to only be contained in those uh, in those book walled rooms, we will then bring the stories um, through critical ethnographies, or we talk about uh, different ways and different methods of doing uh, activist scholarship. But really, the argument here that I'm making is um, to go past that and to say that, um, that really, what is, how do, we, how do we actually talk about the theories that are embedded in those, those very important moments that we just, you know, um, 
we just often ignore. So, um, in a, if I were to just writing, if I were to just write a critical ethnography, I may not be uh, spending so much time thinking about what that particular exchange between Tarun and Sunita was, or what was it that Tama was trying to do when he was showing that little bottle of oil, or what is Prakash trying to do when he's saying very deliberately, it's not just something that he's saying, he's, he, he's, he's making a very important comment when he's saying that now that there are no crops left, and this is, this is in the context of again, acute food insecurity, this man is saying there are no crops left, so now our hunger for Natak and Notanki has increased. So I give those examples as that they, are, they, they push us, each of these instances push us to think about what is there in those, um, those theoretical political vocabularies and how do we become more attuned to them because not to separate them from what we think, but again, uh, the the, the project here is to, to have a conversation between those unequal regimes so that people like uh, Tama and Sunita and Prakash, they don't, they don't just dismiss the academic research as something that has got nothing to do with their lives. So how do we forge these sustained, deep, problematic, disturbing, complicated conversations and make that as part of our our, our project, a long-term sustained project. So I think that's where I'm coming from rather than saying that, oh, now let's get rid of the books and just only um, talk about these stories. Does that, uh, uh, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, the second question, uh, thank you for that question. Um, so this, this issue of how do we, when, when we talk about embodied alliances and when so many things are learned through the body, you know, hungering together, rallying together, fasting together, um, then how do, you, how do you bring that energy back into these spaces where we are just used to listening to each other and, you know, just in, in the form of words and sometimes, you know, just like it's, it all just, yeah, there's just no dynamism that, um, that, is, that defines embodied alliances. Um, so this is something that I've been uh, building in this book, Hungry Translations, and theater becomes a very important part of how we learn to, um, to, to actually enter into a mode of radical vulnerability. And, um, and so I'll just share the example of a very specific exercise that I actually learned from a, a freshman uh, theater student uh, some time ago and then have been trying to translate that into these kinds of spaces. Um, and it has, it has actually worked really well, um, you know, given that in a movement you learn in an embodied alliance, you know, over many years, but if, say, if we have a few hours together, how might we sort of begin to grapple with the basic principles. And I'll just, you know, I'll just share that with you. So, uh, so we, there is this exercise where people form pairs and what, we sh what you're asked to share in pairs is say every, every person would take five minutes or so to talk about um, a deeply transformative moment in their life. You know, so it can be something personal, it's, it can be something related to a political project, whatever it is that has, that has molded them. And, um, and the partners share those, th that story for say five minutes or six minutes, depending on how much time there is and how many people there are in the room. And then um, when we come back to the, to the bigger group to share, then um, each person has to own the other person's story. So you have to actually, you can't check in with the other person um, to make sure whether you're telling their story uh, accurately. You uh, assume their identity and um, they assume yours and then you have to uh, tell the story in an edited fashion. So like say only two minutes uh, for each person to tell the story that they have heard. And the chances are that you will be uh, missing a lot of the details. Chances are that, um, you know, this is not going, to, I mean, there will be some form of violence, but, but with that person present face to face, how is it that we start learning about the responsibility to represent? 
I think it's very, very important for those of us who are treated as experts um, to, to learn, to make this, internalize this, this, this process of becoming radical, radically vulnerable as um, you know, a long, ongoing process um, and to be able to convey that to the people that we encounter in academic spaces and uh, to help them internalize that is, is what I think, um, you know, is, is, is a work that has to be embraced in relation to the kinds of things I'm talking about. And then the third question about um, neoliberalization of the academy um, and uh, becoming precarious in the academy. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know whether this was the intention behind the question, and again, please feel free to elaborate on that, but um, what I see in, 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 the, in the comment that you made, what I see is a, is a, is a possibility for those, for those deeper alliances to happen. So a lot of times in this work with the, you know, the now 15 years or so of working with, um, the Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, one of the things that has been very productive for us is to actually uh, also talk about the academic spaces. You know, the neoliberalization of the academy uh, is not very different from neoliberalization of the arts as well as the neoliberalization of activism, right? I mean, the whole politics of NGOization is deeply connected to, to those processes of neoliberalization that you're talking about. So, so not romanticizing activism as the sacred space where um, you know, pure politics happens. So the same, the same kinds of things that, um, that, that we are subjected to, the same kinds of precarities that we experience, the same kinds of labor politics that happen in the context of the academy, what does it mean to then make connections with that, deeper connections? So, you know, if, if we are in alliance with movements that are outside of academic spaces, how do we develop um, robust, coherent analyses that actually see all of these sites as, as entangled? And I think that entanglement is something that is essential for this kind of, um, this kind of work that I'm, uh, that I'm arguing for. And again, to return momentarily to the book project, the, what the book project does is it takes the, um, you know, the journey of the Sangatnim movement from the writing, the, the nine people writing together to the movement and how the movement has, um, has fought many battles over the last many years. Um, that, that's one section of the book. The other section of the book is actually working through theatrical projects, and I specifically work with um, a very controversial story uh, in Dalit criticism um, that was written in the 1930s, and with artists in Mumbai, um, some of many of them have left villages, you know, to become stars in Bollywood, and have not been able to become stars in Bollywood. Um, and there, there was another group that works as, um, as domestic workers in the homes of TV, TV stars and film, st TV and film artists in, in this one area of Mumbai called Yari Road. And through a six month long theater workshop, um, some, of, some of the people could read and others couldn't, they were not formally literate, but it was like a six month long intense process through which we take one, um, one short story of seven, seven pages and get into the layers of, uh, of what it means through this controversial story to relearn the politics of class, caste, and gender. And, and again, the intention behind the work was to uh, build uh, deeper alliances with uh, struggles that are removed from, so like when you're in, living in Mumbai, you know, you're supposed to be involved in questions of urbanization, you know, and everything that happens in places like Uttar Pradesh is very, very, in, in, in the rural areas of Uttar Pradesh is very remote. So the, um, the goal there was to build deep alliances. How do we forge connections between then and now, between 
complicate the dichotomy between rural and urban and, and, and past and present and so on and so forth. And then, so that's a very detailed work through, which takes the same spirit and uh, places this into the analysis of how this theater was forged. And then the final part of the, of the syllabus, uh, or, or oh, sorry, for, of the book is that syllabus in 15 acts where we bring it all to the uh, University of Minnesota classrooms and think about how these different sites of struggle and learning can then, can then translate back into the classroom space. So this is just one effort. I mean, again, I'm not offering any formulas here, but, but these are some of the ways in which I struggle with this idea and commitment of hungry translations. Great. Um, we have time for another round of questions. So um, do we have any more questions? I've, um, while people are thinking, I've, I've, if, I, if I can use chairs prerogative to ask one, I, I wanted to, uh, maybe it connects to some of the points that you just talked about in relation to the neoliberal university. Um, but I wanted to ask about the limits of hunger. Mm -hmm. um, because the thing about hunger is it always needs to be fed, right? Mm -hmm. And um, neoliberalism is hungry as well, right? Right, right. Um, so I, I wonder whether another way of reading refusal um, is, is not through a, a, a desire to always want to translate it to find out exactly what it means, but also about a right to secrecy, mm -hmm. a, a, right to, a right to say, no, I, I'm not going to be your, 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 your raw material. I'm not right. going to be your data. So Absolutely. to speak, right? Yep. So I just wonder if there's, if one can think yeah. against hunger as well in yes. relation to the broader project. Yes. But, um, yeah. I wonder if there are any more questions now. Okay. All right. So yeah, that's 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 wonderful. Actually, that's precisely what the spirit of the project is. Um, so so yes, you know. Uh, in fact, there is a a poem that appears in, 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 this, in this book that I'm working on, which, is, which begins with, I'm not your data, I'm not your um, story, I'm not your vote bank, etc. cetera. Um, so, so that kind of refusal, you know, that the, the stories that cannot be translated, the stories that will not be offered for consumption, I think that is already, you know, that's an essential part, that's already an essential requirement of this landscape. But at the same time, I am, I'm also responding, I think, you know, in, in a lot of post-colonial conversations, there's also been this, um, this sort of a point where people, like, you know, that nothing can be translated because translation is impossible. And it is to that, you know, it is to that impossibility of translation argument that I am um, responding to by this idea of hungry translation. So, um, so translation as an ongoing relationship that never achieves perfection, but that the, the necessity of that relationship between self and other, if that is foreclosed, then there is no possibility of any translation. But yeah, but it's, it's hungry translation um, go, goes hand in hand with an act of politics of refusals, yeah. refusals where not, you know, not every story is going to be um, served. Um, yeah. I think, uh, there's a question at the back there, yeah. Uh, my name is William Payne from York University in Toronto. Your question and, and one of the questions earlier reminded me of a question I had all through, which really is just a request. If you could, if you would mind telling us about the conversations you have had with the people whose stories you told today about telling their stories in a setting like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting you they, they know that you're yes. telling their stories. And so just for those of us that are more junior, could you talk, tell us about how you do that? Uh -huh. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Just wonder, um, is there any last question that we can add on to that? OK. okay. okay. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, again, I, I don't think there is a standard way in which we can all step into this. But for me, um, being able to write, in, so as, a, as somebody who, who has been writing with the movement, um, I do, I have the ability to 
be able to move between languages and also the, um, you know, the, the, the products or the, the, what is worded moves back and forth between different spaces in different kinds of forms. And um, so, so I can very specifically say uh, about the presentation here is that when I knew that the presentation was going to be recorded, it was very important for me to make sure that every single thing in this presentation was thing, were, were stories and analyses that the, the members of SKMS, specifically those who are represented, could stand with that. And, and for, for when, when many of those people, many, almost all of those people, uh, don't speak and read and write, in English fluently, then that does take an, uh, it is an absolutely essential commitment. You know, there, there's a lot of what ends up being written in, in English for me has already been, been processed and moved and, you know, discussed and deliberated in many, many ways. These have already become lessons of the, of the movement, lessons of the Sangatan, and we've already experimented or explored writing, how do, how do we write about, and not that it's any easier in, in Hindi because there you are dealing with a different kind of political economy, a different kind of cultural economy of audience and reception, but that has to be, to me, that, you know, that is an essential requirement of this kind of uh, work that, um, that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so, yeah, I, does, that, uh, does that answer that question? Thank you. Um, Richard, thank you so much for such a rich and thought-provoking and considered paper. I think lots of the issues you raise will stick with us for the next couple of days and, and well beyond. Um, and also for responding so generously to, to, uh, uh, and in considered ways to the questions. Thank you all as well um, for your questions. Uh, I'm not sure if we can do anything about the hunger, but you might be thirsty. <laughs> so there is a drinks reception now. But um, just to... Uh, for now, if we can just thank Richard for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.